All right. So I love that there's a lot of green today. I love that because we all know it's St. Patrick's Day. Woo! <laughs> now, um, growing up, I was never really too sure what St. Patrick's Day actually was. Um, America, we don't really celebrate it correctly, do we? Um, usually wear green, don't get pinched. If you're not part of the church and you're probably out celebrating in ways that aren't very beneficial for your life. And um, a lot of things that really don't reflect at all what a saint would probably be encouraged to reflect. Um, and in fact, a lot of times, we probably don't even really understand the real story of Patrick. And we, we hear about him, we think, well, he, he drove out all the snakes from Ireland and he, he did that and that was a sign of, of a miracle. False. Um, there's never snakes in Ireland. They haven't been there since the Ice Age. Um, so that wasn't him. That was Jesus many years before. Um, so really, what today I want to kind of talk about is why do we honor St. Patrick? I mean, really, technically, I guess not even really a saint. The Catholic Church never canonized him as one. But for all purposes, why do we honor this man, Patrick? What, what did he do that was so amazing? If he didn't really drive out the snakes, if he didn't really um, do the things we've thought we've known about him. And I want to kind of talk about that. I want to correlate that to not only why we honor him, but how his life can challenge us to grow in our lives as well. So a little interesting thing about Patrick is he grew up in Britain um, in the early, early years shortly after Christ. Um, and then into his teenage years, he, he grew up in a, a Christian household. His dad was a deacon of the church. His grandfather was a priest of the church. He grew up in it. By the time he got to his teenage years, though, he had decided that he didn't truly believe in the faith of his family, and he became an atheist. Right around that same time, people from Ireland came over, and Ireland's not like we know it today. Ireland was considered a very much a tribalistic type island, um, very barbaric in a lot of ways. They came over, stole him, and took him into slavery for six years. So to first off, think about all the great connection that Patrick has to Ireland. I'm sure he didn't agree with that. Um, he didn't start in Ireland. He didn't grow up there. He, he was forced into slavery there and grew up six years, um, which I love this part, because how many people in the Bible begin this way? Watching the flocks of his master. That's where he began his time in Ireland, six years there. And he's written a couple um, letters while he was alive. And these letters are the only reason that we really even know anything about Patrick today. But in it, he said during this time is where he went from atheism to a faith in Christ. That it was times of trial that he decided that he was going to hold on to the truth that he knew his family held. And he began to pray. And in his book, he even talked about how there was times that he would pray a hundred times a day and even more at night. He's just, that's all he had to hold on to in this time and season. And as he prayed and as he fasted through his evenings watching the flocks of his master, he, he began to grow closer to Christ. And at, toward the end of his six years, he received a dream. And in that dream, it said, get ready, you'll return home soon. And I'm sure after six years of slavery, he was extremely ecstatic. And I, I've got to ask, who here has ever had a promise from God? Anybody have any promise from God? I hope there's more than that. <laughs> if you're communing with God, I promise you, you should have a promise. And if you're like me, I am a I want it done now person. Like, I, I'm so excited. I get a dream and a vision. I'm like, let's do it. And I can only imagine after six years of slavery, Patrick was probably a let's go home. But we have no idea how long he was there after that dream. He could have been like Abraham and Sarah and lived another 10, 20, 30 years before receiving a promise. We don't know. But what we do know is that later on after that, he had another dream. And what it was is he saw a ship. And in the dream, Jesus told him, your, your ship is ready. And so he got up and he fled his, his, his master, which I'm sure is probably no easy, easy feat. Um, I've never been a slave. I don't know. But I would imagine that you're stuck in slavery because it's hard to get out of, would be my assumption. And so when he traveled, the issue with this, though, is that he knew that he was leaving by ship, but he was 200 miles inland. He wasn't really next to the coast. So he had to travel 200 miles as a fleeing slave in order to receive to a ship. And when he got there, he finally found one that was owned by pirates of the day. Challenge number 400, I guess. And so he got there and he asked to board. And of course, they said, no, there's no way we're going to let you board a fleeing. And, uh, but he then went to his normal mode that he has done for years at this point. He prayed. He prayed a prayer, a prayer of desperation, cried out to God that you have called me home. You have made a way. Please open up the door. And after praying, he pled with them and they finally let him stow away. 
And however long it took that journey, he stowed away and traveled from Ireland back home. And I'm not going to lie. If that was me, that's probably where the story ends. I'm home. Done. God saved me and delivered me from darkness. But this is why we honor Patrick. And this is why we allow his life to challenge us. Because his story wasn't done. He got home and he decided that because of all the goodness and the grace that God had provided on him, that he was going to pursue a life of ministry. So he began studying the Word of God. He began studying for ministry. And at this point, he was, he was an older person. He was into his early 20s to 30s, which isn't old by any means. But at that time, as far as beginning to study for ministry, he was behind the game. But he began to try and learn and grow. And we see in his letters, he even, he even confessed times of a turmoil and embarrassment because his knowledge wasn't as vast as those around him. But he didn't let it stop him. He continued to study, he continued to grow, he continued to put himself there. And after being home for many years, um, I'd say about 15, 20 years is what the letter said, when he got around 40, he got another vision. And God wasn't done speaking to him and giving him dreams. And in this dream, he saw somebody with baggage and carrying letters and handed it to him. And he had an Irish accent. He said, we need you. And he heard the voice of God calling him back to the place of darkness, back to a place of captivity and slavery, a place that had nothing but trauma for him. And this is where his humanity shines through, and I love it. Because after all that God's done, he didn't say, okay, let's go. He said, God, you want to tell me if that was you or not? <laughs> You want to confirm that a little bit for me? I think I misheard. And he begins to pray if that was really God's voice of reason. And then he receives another dream. And in this dream, he's wrestling with God. And he doesn't see or hear anything except for a spirit from within him. And he knows it's the voice of God praying for him. And they confirmed him that he was being led back to the place of captivity, of darkness, a place of trauma. And around 40 years old, he hops back on a small ship and goes back to his captivity, goes back to meet his, his captors. And his ministry begins. 40 years old, begins a ministry to a place that had no idea of Jesus. Just 20 years prior, the Ireland that he knew had not changed much at all. Still full of tribalism, still full of... of worshiping multiple gods, still full of barbarianism. It was a dark place to go. But he began. He took camp. He started doing the work. And there came a time where the pagan worship ceremony was to begin. It was right around uh, beginning of summer, spring to fall time. And what it was is it was custom that the chief would light one fire. And no other fire was supposed to be lit because this was a sign of worship to their god. But Patrick being the young buck that he was, decided he was going to go against the grain and lit another fire. And when he did, the entire group of people gathered around him and sent him to the king. And his plea was one of incredible, um, it was soft-spoken, but it was also a just simple grace but powerful truth. And he looked at the king and said, I'm not a threat. I'm just here to shine the light of the one true God. And that is how he ushered in Christianity right before the Easter season. And that's when his work really began to take notice and work. By the end of it all, Patrick had lived in Ireland for ministry alone for 29 years. 35 of his life, years of his life was in this place. 29 years was a time of returning back. And in that 29 years, he baptized over 120,000 people and planted 300 churches. That is why we honor Patrick. Not because of some fake snake story, not because of a shamrock with three sides, but because it was a man who put his humanity aside and saw the love and the value of people that otherwise should have been hated. And when we look at him, his, his life, his testimony, he, he went against the grain in so many ways, and he allowed himself to be put aside so that the grace of God would shine through him, and it transformed an island. It, not only did he practice himself, that he allowed this practice to change who he was from a, a slave to sin, a slave literally to a people of darkness, um, but also allowed it to bring salvation. He took that same practice and showed it to these people and brought salvation to this island. So this morning we're going to be talking about going from slave to salvation. 
In doing so, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. If you want to join with me, it'll also be up on the screen. But starting in verse 27, it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. This morning we're going to look at the scripture and we're going to look at that life of uh, Patrick. And we're going to learn how, one, we personally can transform from slave to salvation, but also what we need to do to make an impact on a culture and on an island that we have been placed in to be able to transform them from slave to salvation. The first thing we need to do as it starts off in the scripture is we need to learn to love our enemies. Truth is that none of us has a better reason to hate somebody than Patrick did. We've never been stolen from our home, sold into slavery, forced to be a life that's less than what we've known and could be. We've never been treated horribly. We've never been demeaned as humans. We've never been in any type of situation like that. We have no reason in comparison. But he didn't. He, he didn't take that reason and allow it to justify a hatred. He didn't allow it to keep him from the gap. In fact, if we look at Patrick here, he probably did a little bit better than Jonah. He took what should have been a moment of hate and he allowed the grace of God to transcend who he was. He showed a real love. And that's what we need to do. We need to learn to love our enemies. And by loving them, what that means is we need to learn to truly forgive them. We have to do what Christ exemplified for us. He forgave us, so we've got to forgive them. In the last hours of his life, he laid out that exact moment for us. I was persecuted, you too will be persecuted. You're not greater than the master. Love as I have loved. Do as I have done. He's, he laid it out very simply that in order for us to truly love, we have got to love like Christ did. And that means unconditional, no strings attached. That means it doesn't matter who you were, what you've done. You have nothing that you've ever held in life that can keep me from exemplifying the love to you that Christ has shown me. As the word of God says that while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That while you were at your worst, while I was at my worst, Christ still made a way and loved us without condition. He loved us despite all reason. And that is the kind of love that we're called to give. To not hold strings, to not to do anything like that. To forgive them and to look past their faults, their imperfections, and embrace them for who they are. Last week we talked a little about Zacchaeus and One of the big differences between the crowd, between Satan and Jesus, is that the crowd will call you by your sin. Satan will always remind you of your faults. He'll always remind you of your failures and who you used to be. But Jesus, and therefore those who reflect Jesus, should always be calling them for who they truly are. It doesn't matter your story. Drug addict, no. Redeemed by grace. Alcoholic, no. Conqueror. Desperate and poor, no kings of the children of the king we have new titles and names that the word of god has given us throughout scripture that have embraced who we are in christ we have to be careful that we don't allow our prejudices to define the people around us by who we see them to be but allow that love of christ to transcend through our hearts through our minds to be able to communicate to them who they truly are we are not defined by our sins we're not defined by our past we are defined by who christ is in us And therefore, we need to be defining the world around us as Christ sees them. We love them through forgiveness, we love them through their faults and their imperfections, but also to truly love somebody is to sacrifice for them. And I think sometimes we kind of fall short there. Because it's really hard to make sacrifices if we don't really feel like we're buying into the cause. We only want to give so much. 
But Jesus himself said there's no greater love than a man would sacrifice and lay down his life for another. And a lot of times we call that love, we call it love that we have for people because, hey, we're there and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say some nice things or we'll outreach a hand. But when it comes to really pouring everything we have, when it comes to really giving beyond a certain measure, we hold back for whatever reason, whether we don't see the return, whether we don't um, feel like giving it is going to make a difference. I, we can make any excuse and reason we have, but the truth is that we allow ourselves to hold back. The Word of God says the real love is sacrifice to give of yourself, to say in the end, if it really was my life or theirs, I would choose mine. I would, that, that love to sacrifice yourself, to put yourself in the way, that's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Not just the sacrifice of time and energy, but to say, I would give my life in a moment for the lost. And that's the question we have to ask. Can we look out there and see, can we see the drug addicted? Can we see the alcoholic? Can we see the, the abusers? Can we see molesters? Can we see those that kind of spin the face of Christ? We, we kind of see anymore in our political world this divide more than any other. We see now that you can't disagree without sharp edges, that just almost as defined as a sanctuary is, is the political realm that we live in in America. Can we look across the aisle and say, no matter what you support, whether you support abortion or don't support abortion, whether you support homosexuality or don't, can, can you look at those who stand against the word of God so blatantly and say, I don't care what your stance is. If it was your life or mine, I would lay mine down in a moment. That's love. It doesn't look at their stance. It doesn't look at their belief system. It doesn't look at who they claim to be and say that I will decide your value based upon where you stand. But it's saying I know your value because of who Christ has decided you to be. Love. Love your enemies. Forgive. Look past their faults and sacrifice. Second thing, if we want to transform the culture around us from slave to salvation, not only do we have to love them, but we have to do good for them. Patrick had the opportunity to stay home. He did. He had the opportunity to stay there and let Ireland have, have what it wanted. The truth is, he actually wasn't even the first missionary to Ireland. He was the second. The first one really didn't make much headway. He had been there, put in some time, and there wasn't much of a change in the culture. Patrick could have said bye and let that missionary do what he was doing, or he was actually on his way out and let Ireland just have what was coming to it. But he didn't. Instead of pointing the finger, he moved on and moved forward and went back. And he did incredible things as we saw the transformations. 120,000 baptisms, 300 churches. He did good. But if we're going to do good for our enemies, we have to make sure that we allow the goodness of God to seep through everything that we do. Everything. We can't pick and choose which areas we're going to show goodness to the world around us. We can't just say, I said nice things to you, so that, that was good enough. It takes a compilation of everything that we are and every experience and every encounter to allow goodness to portray to them. So the first thing we have to do is our words have to be good. We have to start with saying those, those good things. We can't be speaking, speaking ill and evil against them. Now, there's one thing to call out truth. <laughs> Jesus did it. The, the prophets did it. Many times they called them perverse generations. We see times where Jesus called them brood of vipers and even called Peter Satan at some point, there's going to be times that words may be hard to swallow. doesn't necessarily mean they're not good. But we have to make sure that the good we speak is through love and is through truth. It is not through our anger. It is not through our frustrations. It's not through our own emotional feelings. But it's grounded in truth and in love. Be good. Speak good. The Word of God says it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And the truth is, if we can't look at our enemies, if we can't look at Islamic radical extremists, if we can't look at the other side of the political aisle, if we can't do those things and speak good of them, then the truth is our heart probably needs some cleaning, probably needs some evaluating, probably needs some transforming itself. Because if we can't speak good, according to the word of God, our hearts aren't good. They're defiled, they're dirty, they're messed up. We've got to make sure that we're allowing our words to be of goodness, that they're being of love and encouragement lifting up, that they are speaking beyond the, the facts and speaking the truth of the word of God. There's a difference. 
difference between facts and truth. The facts are I can see what it is. I can see what's going on. I can see what you're saying and what you're doing, the life you're living. It's a fact. But the truth is the Word of God. The Word of God transcends everything. It has power over our situations and our circumstances. So look past it. Speak the truth of the Word of God over their lives and change who they are, even if they're not willing to do it themselves. Second way that we can be good is we have to be good through our thoughts. Jesus transformed the religious thought with the simple teaching that you say it's sin to murder your brother, but I tell you it's sin to hate them. A simple idea that he had changed a, a established religious rule that sin was only dictated by the things we did. But he came to allow us to realize that sin also comes through the things we think. It's not just what we do. It's, it's what we allow our minds to, to think. It's the realities that we allow it to create within our minds that is also a sin. If our thoughts are so filled of hate and anger and darkness, but we allow our words to be good, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Truth is, is that maybe you are helping them move out of slavery to salvation, but you're allowing you to slip back. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Build up your mind. Build it with the Word of God. Read it and dig into it. We talked a little bit about Wednesday. If you weren't here, then I want to encourage you with soaps. Dig into the Word of God with your devotions through reading the Scripture and writing it down. Writing down what you've observed in the Scripture, how you can apply it to your life, and pray it. Pray the Scripture. Allow that to cleanse who you are and keep it purified into your mind and your heart and your spirit because that is going to be what helps keep you safe. The mind, whenever you allow it to become defiled, you can try to play games and act good all day long, but it will be found out. The Word of God tells us that, and whenever uh, God was trying to appoint a new king and Samuel was overlooking all of Jesse's sons, he pointed out all the natural candidates, the tall one, the strong one, the handsome one, and none of them were the right fit. And then finally, they found the little shepherd boy who was watching the flocks. He was small, tiny, not very strong. And God pointed at him and said, that's a new king. And what he told Samuel was that you look on the outside, but God looks at the heart of man. Our minds and our hearts are so tightly correlated that if there is darkness con connecting within us, if it's, if it's taking over how we think, then it is going to impurify our hearts. And we will find ourselves separating from the God that we are trying to reach the lost for. And the truth is, they're going to see it. They'll see it. We all know fake a mile away, don't we? We can all look at somebody who's not sincere and real, and we can know it. You are doing an injustice to you, you're doing injustice to the world, and you're doing injustice to God when you try to act apart without allowing it to transform who you are. Be good in your words, be good in your thoughts, but be good in your actions as well. The Word of God tells us we are the extended hands and feet of Jesus. What that means is that when you walk, claiming to, as the Bible would say, walk in the way, or as the word Christian implies, be a little Jesus. As we walk and imitate who Christ is, the things we say, the things we do, the things we think are a reflection of how the world sees Jesus. We wonder why the world has a bad idea who Jesus is, because we have been a bad reflection of it. And that's sometimes a hard pill to swallow. We can point to be angry about that, but it's true. The church has not been a good reflection of who Jesus Christ is. And that is why we have such a hard time telling the world and convincing them that they need him. Be the imitation of Christ. Be his hands and his feet. Don't go around and say good things and think good things, but not do good things. You don't get to draw the line. What you do, what you say, what you think, the world will correlate to Jesus, whether you like it or not. You don't get to decide when they stop seeing Jesus in you. Make sure that the painting that you are the, the picture you're painting of Jesus is actually who he is. Be sure that it is lining up with his character. That is our call, like I said, to know him, to make him known, to imitate him in everything that we do. Make sure that you are being an image of Jesus that we are called to be.
You are his hands and his feet. The moment you say that prayer, the moment you surrender who you are for his grace to come over you, the moment you repent of sin and accept the life that he has to offer, you became the extension of who he is. Not sometimes, every time, every moment of every day. Make sure that you are taking care of that. And the next thing, if we are going to transform our culture and ourselves from slave to salvation, we have to lend to our enemies. We see that in verse 29, but what I would more so like to point out to this is a better description of this is to give. Give to your enemies. To lend is the idea that you're going to receive back. We have to get outside of that mindset. If we want to make an impact on the culture, we have to quit giving with the attention of receiving. That is against everything that Christ has told us to do. It says to give freely, to give openly, to give without condition, just as much as we love. Christ gave his life on the cross. And in doing so, he still gave the freedom for you and I to choose yes or no to his love. He gave it, knowing full well that there are so many lives that have come and gone since then that will not be welcoming him in heaven. He gave it freely, without any strings attached. He said, this is my goodness and my grace. I'm trying to cross the divide trying to give you a way in. And he did it without demanding that every single person sign on the dotted line and say yes. It was an offered gift. We have to make sure that when we give, it's a gift. It's free to be taken, free to be denied, free to be used in whatever way it can. We just give it freely with prayer, with, with fasting, with, with the Spirit of God guiding it. And pray that God does what he intended to do through it. Patrick made the sacrifice. He sacrificed his family. He sacrificed his life going to a place that was nothing but heartache and pain for him. He sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears. Um, I don't know if he was a good builder or not. I know I'm not. So if I was trying to build 300 churches, I'd probably hit my thumb a few times. I'd probably bled a few times. Um, And I'm sure that he did too. He's only human. But he sacrificed so much. But he gave his heart the most important thing. He gave his heart fully and without apology. He gave everything he had to this country of of darkness. He gave everything he had to a country that had enslaved him and tore him from his family. And he came back without any type of demand. All he said is, let me show you the light of Christ. Let me light a fire and show you the true light, the true way. And he just showed them. He showed them. When we lend, we have to make sure that we are showing that love and goodness of Jesus Christ, not just in what we give, but by how we give it. We've got to make sure that what we give is the best in everything we do. The Bible talks about how a good father gives only good gifts. That if his son asks for a good gift, he wouldn't give him a snake. He wouldn't give him anything bad. And when we try to give anything but the best, we are in in turn doing the same kind of thing. If we're not giving the best, we are misrepresenting a in God. God's not a God of mediocrity. He's not a God of partial giving. He gave everything, so we must demonstrate that same thing. We've got to give the best of what we have to give. If we, if we look at somebody who's in need and, and we have a, let's just say they're cold and, and they're homeless and we have a, a wonderful quilt here and then we have a small little handkerchief and we hand them the handkerchief and say, keep warm. What kind of display of goodness is that? What kind of gift is that? But a lot of times, spiritually, what's happening in the things we can't see, that's the kind of gift we're giving to the world. We're not meeting the need fully. We're not giving them the best that we have to give them. We're just giving them a snippet and say, if you like it, then you can come back. And then we'll give you once you come and join. That's not giving. That's, that's a preliminary. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a deal. That's a negotiation. That's not how we're to operate in the kingdom of God. We don't negotiate. We just give freely and expect and, and believe the Holy Spirit to use that gift to transform and change who they are. Not only do we have to make sure that we're giving the best, but we have to make sure that we're giving, that we're not expecting again in return. We're not trying to negotiate. We're not trying to say we'll only give if you come back. 
we understand this, that humanity, salvation is not a monetary investment. It's an eternal investment. We give and we hope and pray that we see that investment in heaven. We don't demand a return now. God does the work. The Word of God says that one man plants, another man waters, but only the Spirit can bring fruit. We've got to understand that it's not our jobs to make anything grow. We just plant, we care for it, and we let the Spirit do what the Spirit is here to do. That's how we love people. Keep your eyes on the prize. Look for that internal investment. Hope and pray that one day you see that seed alive and active and healthy in the gates of heaven. That's the return. So today, we've talked about this transformation. We transform through loving our enemies. We transform through doing good. And we transform by giving of ourselves. And so, right now, I want each and every one of us to go ahead and close our eyes. I want you to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be able to respond without any concerns. I have a few questions for you. What islands, what cultures are you transforming today? What people are changing from slave to salvation based on your life today? And if they're not, and you can honestly say no one, then the question is, is where are you falling short? And that's okay. It's okay if you're falling short. We all do. The, the, the value is being able to detect it and to make a change in that. So are you truly loving them the way the Father loves them? Are you sacrificing, giving everything that you have to give? Are you demonstrating goodness in everything you do? Are you giving only the best with no expectation of return? Or maybe you're on the other end of that, and you're sitting here realizing that you're really a part of the culture, that you can't transform it because you're part of it. And you're the one who needs that transformation. You're the one who needs somebody to light that fire and point to the one true light. The one true way. That's what you need to mourn. And that's okay. But if any of you said yes to any of those questions today, saying that you need to learn to love better, or you need to learn to demonstrate goodness in everything you do, or you need to learn to give without expectation of return, or you just need to see the light, if that's you at all, then we're just going to have you slip up a hand this morning. Okay, and we're just going to say a church prayer this morning together. And after we're done praying, I'm going to have the worship team come up here and play through. And if you feel like you need time in the altar alone, or if you want somebody with you, we're here. That's what we're here for, to lift you up and to build you up, to encourage you in the kingdom. After we're done praying, if you need to come up here to the altar, it's open. Pray away. And let us know if there's anything we need from you. You need from us. If you need us to help encourage you, if you need us to help lift you up, if, if you just need somebody to talk to you for a moment, let us know. And we're going to be here to help that transformation the entire way through. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for shining your light. Thank you for interrupting my darkness and showing your love. Thank you that salvation is through nothing that I do but what you've done. Look inside me and bring to light all the things I've hidden. Forgive me for my sins and help me walk in your truth and your light. If my love has fallen short, help me to love purely. If my goodness hasn't been in every aspect of my life, help me be intentional. And if I'm not giving the best without expectation of return, Help me to not be selfish and to give better. 
I give my life to you. And I welcome your light. Amen.